Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, This is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plough his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we shall be like all the other nations, with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the Israelites, everyone go back to your own town. Well, good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to be here this morning. Great to be able to speak on this very uh, pertinent passage. Um, if I haven't met you before, my name is James Burstow. Everybody calls me Jeeb. Um, I'm the senior elder at Grace Church. And um, yeah, it's a real privilege to be able to, to speak. So as we start, why don't we pray together and ask for God's help? Father, we ask for your wisdom and insight now as we consider your word. And we pray that by your spirit, you would help us to see you more clearly and love you more dearly as a result of what we read and think about together now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so if you have the passage uh, still open in front of you, 1 Samuel chapter 8, that would be great. Because um, we're continuing our series in that um, wonderful book. And we have I've called this sermon choose your king because as becky's just read to us that's what this chapter is all about and it's it's interesting when you stop and consider how many great stories revolve around the rule of a king or queen so uh my family have just watched the new mulan film <clears throat> which is all about saving the good and wise and kind emperor from an evil enemy who wants to overthrow him and take his place. Think about something like Robin Hood. Uh, you've got a, a just king who's overseas uh, fighting a just war and in his place is the evil Sheriff of Nottingham. Uh, think about, it's the same idea with the Lion King. You've got Scar versus Simba, the rightful king. Narnia with the White Witch and Aslan. King Arthur restoring Camelot um, with his noble Knights of the Round Table. The list goes on and on. Kings and queens are very important to us because as human beings, it seems inevitable that we will be ruled. 
That just seems to be the way the world is. And so it matters to us a great deal who we are ruled by. And that's what we're going to think about this morning. So let's set the scene. Uh, The first three verses of chapter eight do that for us. Have a look. Samuel's grown old and he's actually presided over a pretty good period for the Israelites. We saw last week back in chapter seven that the Lord had kept their arch enemies, the Philistines, at bay and restored some territory to them that had been taken from them. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. But now that he's old, Samuel has appointed his sons as Israel's leader, leaders, and that's not working out very well. And if that sounds familiar to you, then you're right, because back in chapter two, we saw exactly the same thing with Eli, the former priest, and, and when he put his sons in charge, who were disastrous. And now Samuel's sons are going the same way. Uh, in verse three, it says that Joel and Abijah did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. They're serious charges. This is a tricky situation. And, you know, we could probably have a long discussion about what's gone wrong with Samuel's sons and why history is repeating itself again. But, you know, the text doesn't really tell us. And that actually isn't the focus of this passage. The focus is not on what's gone wrong, but how the people respond. And quite understandably, I think, the elders of Israel were unhappy. Uh, Verse four tells us that they gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they came with a bold request. In verse five, it's there. They say, Samuel, you are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now, appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. And at first glance, you might think that sounds quite reasonable. I mean, they are in a tricky situation. Uh, They've had a period of prosperity under good leadership, but now things aren't working out with Samuel's sons and they need to stop the rot. And on top of that, God has previously promised his people a king. So, you know, maybe now's the time. And yet we see in verses six to nine that this request does not go down with Samuel and more importantly, It doesn't go down well with God. Why not? Have a look at verse six. When they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done since the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. So the people ask for a king and God sees it as a personal rejection because that is exactly what it is. And he warns them through Samuel that the king they're asking for will not be good for them. Why? Well, because they're asking for the wrong kind of king with the wrong kind of motives. And God sees right through it and exposes the reality that this is just another example of the Israelites rejecting him and rejecting his rule. After all, he says they already have a king, him, but they're not satisfied. They want to choose a different king. And I think there are three underlying attitudes Uh, that we see here in the text behind the choice that they're making. So let's have a look at those. First first attitude is this, we know best. We know best, God, not you. There is no doubt there's a problem with Samuel's sons. That's clear. The question is, what do they do about it? What's their response? Well, they come to Samuel with their plan all worked out. There's no sign of any prayer. There's no sign of seeking God's wisdom. There's no call to repentance, as we've seen in earlier chapters when things have gone wrong. They're essentially saying, we've thought about it, we've come up with a solution, and what we need from you is just a rubber stamp, please, so we can make it all happen. Now, the idea that they might know better than God seems ridiculous, doesn't it? And yet, I have a nasty feeling 
that I treat God like that sometimes. I wonder if there are times when you do too. The second underlying attitude is we want to be like everyone else. Can you see that in their request there? Appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. Now, this is especially striking coming from the elders of Israel because they've always been called to be distinct, set apart, a light to the nations. And in their best moments, other nations have looked to them and seen how they are different and there's something distinctive about them which points to their God, Yahweh. But here the tables are turned. They've started looking at everyone else. They've started wanting to be like them, not the other way around. They don't want to be different. They want to be the same. And again, if we're honest, we might feel a little bit of sympathy with that. Because the people of God today are still called to be different, to be distinctive. 1 Peter 2 verse 9 says we're called to be a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Now that's hard work, isn't it? And sometimes it can be tempting to think it would be easier just to blend in a bit more. Just to be like everyone else. And then the third underlying attitude is... Essentially, we think a substitute king will be better. That's the crux of the issue. Because they say they, they want a king, but they have a king. They have a king who brought them out of Egypt, who has proved his love and his power again and again, who in their lifetime has delivered them from enemies, who's expanded their lands, who's brought them peace, who's blessed them as a nation. But at the first sign of trouble, they start looking around feeling that they might be able to find a better king, someone who can give them what they want in the way that they want it, perhaps more of a traditional king, a king who does things in a slightly more conventional way. They've seen other people's kings and it seems to be working out well for them. So they think they might be better off and after all, they know best. So suddenly the problem with this bold request becomes clear. And the parallels for us become clear too, don't they? Uh, we'll have a chance to think about this further in our home groups. And, and by the way, um, home groups are the place where we kind of delve into this application in our lives. If you're not part of a home group, it, this is a great time to, to join in. And uh, you can talk about this in much more detail. Um, but in a nutshell, just like the Israelites, we can be tempted to think we know best. We struggle to be different and distinctive from the world around us. And we all too easily choose substitute kings instead of being faithful to the true king. And ultimately, it boils down to where we put our hope. Who or what are we trusting in? Because that's what the king represents. And the Israelites at this moment are choosing a different king. They're putting their hope elsewhere. And in verses 10 to 18, Samuel's very honest with them about the inevitable outcomes of the choice that they're making. And he doesn't pull any punches. So let's have a look at these three inevitable outcomes. First of all, their substitute king will take, 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 take. Read with me from, from verse 10 and, and count the number of times, the number of things this king will take. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and others to plough his ground and reap his harvest and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use and he will take a tenth of your flocks and make that six. Far from giving them what they want, this substitute will 
king will take and take and take and take and take and take. And you know, this is actually not unusual behaviour for human kings and queens, I'm afraid, throughout history. It's what most monarchs do. Not only is the Bible littered with stories of kings oppressing their people and taking their stuff, but secular history books are too. I'm a big fan of the Matthew Shardlake novels by C.J. Sanson, which are set in the time of Henry VIII. And there are constant episodes of land being grabbed, the poor being exploited, men being sent off to pointless wars, uh, women being abused, enemies being imprisoned and executed. Take, 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 take. It's what happens. But even worse than that, Samuel says in verse 17 that they will end up as slaves. He says, you yourselves will become his slaves. They think they're gaining freedom. They've looked at the other nations and concluded they're free. Their grass is definitely greener than ours. So they want to be like that. But the reality couldn't be further from the truth. They are destined to become enslaved. And then worst of all, they will become alienated from God. Have a look at verse 18. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you've chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. It's inevitable that as you move towards another king, you move away from Yahweh. Kings are rulers and you can't be ruled by two different kings. As Jesus put it in Matthew 6, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. And so God, through Samuel, is being very honest here. If you choose another king, that's fine, but you need to live with that decision. Don't call out to me for relief from the very thing that you said you wanted. It's heavy stuff, isn't it? It's, it's blunt, honest. And the amazing thing is that having heard all that, what do the elders say? Oh, um, you've made some excellent points. Uh, perhaps could we just withdraw that request and pretend this conversation never happened? No, they don't say that. Uh, verse 19 tells us that the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we'll be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. You, you can imagine Samuel sort of shaking his head in disbelief. When he heard all that the people had said, he repeated it before the Lord, and the Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. So God gives them their choice. They're determined to press ahead, regardless of the warnings, and God doesn't stand in their way. He gives them their choice. He gives them their choice. Now, I don't think that for most of us, our biggest problem is being tempted away from God by a human leader. I don't want to get too political, but I'm guessing that most of us aren't saying, we don't want you, God. We want Boris Johnson or Keir Starmer or Ed Davey. They'll deliver everything that we're dreaming of. With all due respect to them, that's probably not the biggest temptation for most of us this morning. But this passage is hugely relevant for us right now because the pandemic that we're in the middle of has affected our lives in dramatic ways. It's made things so much more uncertain. It's shaken up our normality. Some of us have taken pay cuts. Some of us have been made redundant. Some of us have felt more lonely during lockdown than we've ever felt before. Some of us are incredibly anxious about everything that's happening. Some of us are worried about the future. And at times like these, we might be tempted, as the Israelites were, to start looking around for other ways to get what we want and what we need. We are just as likely as they were to be lured away by the promise of someone or something who can solve our problems and deliver our dreams. And if we won't be ruled by God, then we will be ruled <clears throat> by someone or something else. So we have a choice. You have a choice. Which king are you going to choose? Which king do you want to be ruled by? 
essentially the king represents anything that we can't obtain for ourselves and we feel like we need to make us happy. Perhaps political stability, economic prosperity, but it could be good schools so our children can be educated well, a fulfilling career, popularity at school, great exam results, a pension that's performing well so we can enjoy a comfortable retirement. Pick the one that's most important to you. Now, none of these things are bad in themselves. They're good. But the problem comes when they become so important that you essentially end up worshipping them. And they are in real practical terms more important to you than anything else in your life. You become their slave. And far from making you happy, they leave you feeling perpetually dissatisfied. One of my heroes is Jason Robinson. Here he is. He was in the England rugby team that, that won uh, the Rugby World Cup in 2003. In fact, he scored our only try in the final. And before he switched to rugby union, he was a big rugby league star up in Manchester. And let's just say that he fully embraced the celebrity lifestyle um, that so many people these days dream of, actually. He had a successful career. He had loads of money. He had fast cars. He had adoring fans. He had lots of girlfriends. He had invitations to all the best parties. You name it, he was, he was doing it. He was living it. But here's the thing. He wasn't satisfied. In fact, he was actually slipping into despair. And then he met a fellow rugby player called Inga Twigamala. Some of you will know Twigamala, who just happened to be a Christian. And I, and I want to read you a little section from his uh, autobiography about that time. Here's what he says. One minute... I was a young lad with the world at my feet. Then I was in this ever-deepening black hole, but still I kept drinking as a means to escape. But through the fog of my own despair, I could not help but notice Twigamala. This big man from Western Samoa was to prove the starting point of my salvation. In Twigamala, I saw a man who was always happy. I had looked for happiness from relationships, from cars, from alcohol, but nothing so far had fulfilled what I was searching for. I might be happy for a week, for two weeks, but it never lasted. I was chasing material things, a bigger house, a nicer car, but I was never satisfied. Twigamala wasn't chasing anything. He didn't go out drinking with the lads. He didn't sleep around. He didn't have the best car in the car park. Why was he so happy? Jason realized that his king wasn't delivering. He'd been deceived. And he could see that Twigamala's king really was. And Twigamala's king was, of course, Jesus. And Jesus is a very different kind of king. He is the ultimate king that God had always promised his people. A king who, was, who is simultaneously far more powerful and mighty than any king there's ever been. And yet at the same time is humble and gentle and true. In so many ways, Jesus is a king like no other. But, but let's just think about his differentness in the three categories we considered earlier. Firstly, Jesus doesn't take. He gives. He gives. You only have to read one of the eyewitness accounts of his life to see that he constantly gives of himself in every way, but including in the ultimate way. Mark 10 verse 45, a famous verse. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Not only does he not take like human kings and idols, but he gives his very life for his people. Secondly, Jesus doesn't enslave, he frees. Let me, let me read another little extract from the end of Jason's book here. He says, people often think that because of my devotion to Christianity, my life must be restricted. But I feel freer now than I have ever done. I can say yes or no. I couldn't say no before. It is only since becoming a Christian that I realise how bound I was before. Jesus doesn't enslave. He doesn't restrict. He brings freedom. And thirdly, Jesus doesn't alienate, but he actually makes us children of God. He brings us so close, we become children of God. Romans 8 verse 15 says, The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. 
Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Children of God, not slaves, not even subjects, but children adopted into the very family of the king. Incredible. It is true that we were made to be ruled by a king, but not by any old king. Not by a king like other people have. By the king, by the servant king, by the perfect king, by the eternal king, by the king above all kings. Don't be tempted by any other king. Choose Jesus as your king because he made you. He cares for you. He loves you. So finally, how do we do that? How do we choose Jesus as our king in the first place? And how do we go on choosing him as our king throughout our lives, fighting that temptation to look around? Well, I've just got three steps and they're all taken from last week's sermon. So if you were listening then, this will all seem very familiar. First one is repent. Turn away from sin and to Jesus. We need to humble ourselves before this king. Don't think that you know better than God. If you're watching today and you're, you're not yet a Christian, it's wonderful that you're with us. You're very, very welcome. But this is the first thing that you need to do if you want to become a Christian. You need to accept that Jesus is king, that he knows best, that he rules, and then follow him. And repentance is an ongoing requirement for those of us who are already Christians too. Colossians 2 verse 7 says, Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. He knows better than us. He's greater than us. We need to follow him, not the other way around. So we need to repent and submit to his rule. And when we notice that we're drifting away, we need to turn back. That's repentance. Secondly, commit yourself to the Lord. Commit to follow him no matter what. Decide to do what he says, whether it fits with what you feel like doing or not. It means we need to treat Jesus as a king rather than a consultant. A king tells you what to do and then you do it because he's the king. A consultant gives you advice and then leaves you to decide whether to implement it or not. So think about it. Does Jesus tell you what to do and you do it? Or does he make recommendations which you sort of weigh up uh, and then decide whether to act on them or not? So he says, forgive. You say, I'll think about it, but it's not as simple as that, unfortunately. He says, sex is for marriage. You say, well, it used to be, but things are a bit more flexible these days. He says, put me first. You say, it's just I've got lots of other priorities. He won't have that. You need to say, not my will, but yours be done. You need to commit yourself to the Lord. And like repentance, that takes humility and it takes faith that following Jesus is best. Which leads us to the third thing, which is trust. Trust his promises. And this can be harder because it means accepting the circumstances that God brings into your life. Some of us obey because we know we should, but we find it hard to trust, especially when our king doesn't do things the way we want. That's how the Israelites felt when with Samuel's sons in charge. And like them, that's the moment we start to look around for substitutes. So we say, Jesus, I'm sick and you haven't healed me. Or I'm lonely and you haven't provided someone for me. Or I'm anxious and you're not addressing my fears. Whatever it is, when God doesn't answer our hopes and needs in the way we think he should, we start to look around. We start to believe that a substitute might provide what God has not. We can start to look at the nations over there or our, na uh, our neighbour, our friends over there and think, I want what they've got. It seems to be working out for them. Maybe it's time for me to try something else. But don't be deceived. The grass is not greener. Their kings are not better. We must trust his promises. We must trust that he is good. We must trust that he is better than any other king. And we must trust that he works in all things for the good of those 
who, who love him, including you. And a big part of that is remembering how he's provided for you and loved you in the past. The Israelites were so quick to forget the good things the Lord had done for them, for all the many, many ways he proved his love for them and his power to deliver what they needed. And we're no different. And that's why taking time to thank God for things when we pray is so important, because it, it makes us stop and notice his blessings, his provision, his love. And it's why reading his word is so important, so we can remember all that he's done for us in Christ and all that he's promised for us. Now, you know, I don't believe that anybody will get to the end of their life and regret that they decided to choose Jesus as their king. I don't think any of us will lie on our deathbed and think, I wish I'd followed that substitute king rather than Jesus. So repent, commit yourself to the Lord, trust his promises. And when we do those things, we will love him. You can't force yourself to love someone and nobody can force you to love them either. It has to come naturally. That's why God didn't force the Israelites to live under his rule. But as we repent and as we commit and as we trust, our love for Jesus will grow. Why? Because he's the servant king. You serve him because he served you first. You draw near to him because he's already drawn near to you. You make sacrifices for him because he's already sacrificed everything for you and you love him because he already loves you more than anyone ever has or ever could. That is the kind of king Jesus is. And that is the kind of king that I want to be ruled by. Don't you too? We're going to sing a song in a minute that sums up much of what I've been saying. Um, and I'm just going to close in prayer and start with some words from that song. So why don't we pray together? Let's pray. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Lord Jesus, we praise and worship you as our matchless king, crowned with many crowns, seated in splendour on the throne of heaven. And yet at the same time, the one who gave your life that we might live, that we might be free, that we might be called children of God. Please forgive us when we're tempted to worship other people or other things instead of you. And give us the faith, we pray, to repent and commit and trust you all the days of our lives, whatever they may bring. And as we do that, please grow our love for you as we understand more and more just how deeply and completely you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing. <laughs>